Hello there, my name is Sarah, and I'm reading Secret City by Jan Andrew Henderson, a ghost story set in Edinburgh. We're up to chapter 9, The Forge. Charlie half expected to see Lily juggling elephants, or something equally bizarre, when he burst into the theatre, but she was sitting on the floor in her usual green dress, drinking a can of Coke. Charlie's face was red and sweating after running halfway down the Royal Mile, so Lily held out the drink to him and he took a huge gulp. Bubbles shot out of his nose. Oh, charming. Listen, the boy spluttered after three minutes of uncontrollable hiccuping. There really is treasure in the underground city, in a set of blocked-up tunnels. It's in Peasel's journal. Oh, sorry. He handed the can, over, overflowing with froth, back to Lily, who looked at it in disgust. There's silver, lots of it, according to the book. Told you. Lily allowed herself a triumphant little smile. Yeah, but we're in trouble. There's council workers excavating down there. You said so yourself. Charlie pointed to the back of the big top. We need to get underground and find that treasure before they do. We? Thought I was just a lookout. Uh, I don't know about you, said Charlie hotly, but that treasure would mean an awful lot to me. You've never seen where I live. It's small and it's cheap because my parents hardly make any money. If you hadn't noticed, there isn't exactly a lot of work at a job centre for acrobats. Hey, 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 Lily held up a hand. Calm down, take a seat. She pulled Charlie down beside her and he sat, chest heaving, trying to get his emotions as well as his breathing under control. For a start, you don't know if the council workers are digging anywhere near the treasure. But they might be, Charlie interrupted, running his hand through his, ha th through his hair. They might reach it any day. Yes, but you don't know that. Lily took the boy's hand and stared earnestly into his face, her green eyes somehow soothing him. Charlie, we don't even know if the treasure is still there. The boy began to shake his head, but she squeezed his hand tighter. The diary is almost... 200 years old, remember? He nodded sullenly. You need to read the rest of the book before you go running back into those tunnels. She gave one more last squeeze before letting go of his hand. You need to find out exactly what's down there. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Charlie stood up and went to the, to the ranks of chairs where the audience normally sat. He plonked himself down and pulled out the diary. What are you doing? Taking your advice, he looked up. I'm going to finish the diary. Go ahead, juggle if you want. He went back to the book and began reading. Lily pulled several multicoloured balls from the pockets and began to toss them in the air, her hands moving faster and faster until there were no more than a pink smear. After a while, the balls were joined by glittering stars circling around each other like a tiny galaxy. One of the balls burst into flames without interrupting its mad spinning. Charlie didn't look up. Lily sighed. The balls began to vanish one by one, their motions got slower, and the stars glittered less brightly and went out. Finally, only the flaming ball spun uncertainly on the end of the girl's finger. With a flick of her wrist, her hand enveloped the flames, snuffing it out, and the ball dropped, smoking to the floor. Lily walked over to Charlie. Oh, budge up then, she said, sitting next to him. Let's have a look. The tunnel seemed to be levelling out at last, but I was no longer scared of meeting any monsters, or not very much, uh, for I had my magnificent sword, which I intended to sell as soon as I could find my way to the surface. Uh-oh. Pizel looked up at the his spluttering torch. The shadows in the tunnel were becoming thicker and darker as the firebrand's flame grew lower. The pickpocket increased his pace, but he couldn't go much faster, for the extent of his ill health was making itself painfully obvious. The boy had a nagging stitch in his side and his breath was coming in ragged gasps. And the reduced light meant that he stumbled on the uneven floor every few feet, sometimes sprawling head first across the pitted floor. On the fourth or the fifth fall, he lay exhausted, while the firebrand's flame faded to smoky embers and the tunnel melted into a terrifying blackness. Still lying on the floor, Peasel curled himself into a ball and began to cry. Gradually his crying turned to a shivering whimper, for the tunnel was cold and the heat that Peasel had worked up during his early exertions was evaporating. He closed his eyes, 
pulled his, ed- his elbows and his knees in tighter, trying to shut out the cold and the darkness and the fear, but lay perfectly still, had made him aware of something that he hadn't noticed before. He could hear a faint, sinister hiss somewhere up ahead. A snake! Peasel's eyes shot open. His hand went to the hilt of his sword. He drew the weapon slowly from his leather belt and held it protectively in front of his face. To his astonishment, the sword glowed with a pale blue luminance. Not as effective as the firebrand, but enough to let him see the few feet of the passage ahead. Peasel knew that lying down nothing, no matter how scared he felt, wasn't going to help solve his predicament. And something was making that hiss. Of course, it might be a giant underground snake, but then again, it might just be the wind blowing in from somewhere outside. There was only one way to find out, so he struggled to his feet and he started forwards, jabbing the sword aggressively before him. Whatever the tunnel, whenever the tunnel branched, Peasel listened carefully, then went in the direction of the noise. And he knew he was choosing well, for at each fork, the sound got louder though never as loud as the pounding of his heart. Then the passage ended, and Peasel found himself looking into a small volcanic chamber, triangular in shape, not much lighter than his head, not much higher than his head. At the narrow end of it, a stream emerged from a rock fissure and rolled sluggishly through a gash in the floor, eroded by centuries of flowing water. At the wider end, it vanished into a darkness again. Peasel gripped his sword hand tighter, for the surface of the stream danced and sparkled with a strange red light that made the lo- the water look suspiciously like blood. The pickpocket had once overheard a conversation between two learned gents about Greek mythology, whatever that was. They recounted a story about how dead souls were ferried down an underground river and into hell which was guarded by a three-headed hound called Cerberus. The pickpocket looked around in terror. Hi, Stoggy, he hissed and sank to his knees, clasping his hands in front of his face. Please, please, get me out of this. He closed his eyes, praying to whatever deity happened to be listening. I have always wanted to die rich, but not ten minutes after I got rich. He opened one eye and he looked pleadingly upwards. Come on, I will do everything. Anything, just give me a sign. An object came hurtling out of the blackness above and plunged into the stream. Showering the pickpocket with icy needles of water, he scuttled back against the chamber wall, gasping with cold and fear and waving his sword ineffectively at the general direction of the unknown attacker. The water broke again and a wooden bucket tied to the end of a rope emerged full and dripping from the water course. It rose jerkily back up and vanished into a red glowing hole in the chamber wall. Whoa, hey, whoever's up there, the pickpocket screamed at the top of his voice. I'm down here, here. Oh, damn. He still held the silver sword. He looked round in panic and spotted a large boulder, ran over and pushed the sword into the shadows behind it. He whirled back, took a deep breath, jumped into the icy stream and waded to the centre of the chamber. Above him, he could now see a long, thin funnel rising 40 feet through the solid rock of the chamber roof and ending in a circle of red light. Suddenly, he knew exactly where he was. Shadow Jack! Shadow Jack Henry, I'm down here. The pickpocket yelled up the funnel. I'm down here. He waved his arms maniacally, though nobody above could possibly see him. I'm at the bottom of your well. A bearded face appeared in the red circle above. Peasel, is that you? Shadow Jack's voice echoed down the shaft. How the hell did you get down there? The rope and bucket came hurtling down again. Shivering and crying, Peasel sat on the bucket, arms and legs wrapped around the sodden rope, and Shadow Jack Henry pulled him to safety. A few minutes later, Peasel was sitting in Shadow Jack's vault, wrapped in a woolen blanket and sipping a cup of hot ale. A pot of the sweet-smelling brew bubbled on the forge, and the pickpocket's clothes hung steaming on the bar above. Shadow Jack 
sat next to the boy, stripped to the waist, holding his own mug in a giant scarred hand. He listened intently, nodding occasionally, while Peasel told him about his underground journey. The pickpocket missed out the part about the treasure. He wasn't about to trust such a big man with so much wealth at stake. That's a fine adventure, without a doubt, he said when Peasel had finished. The two stared at each other for a long time, until the blacksmith spoke again. If you go back to the surface, they'll probably just arrest you. Peasel nodded bitterly. No, I don't think I would be much of a friend if I let you go back to the surface. Shadow Jack stroked his beard slowly, still looking keenly at the boy. The pickpocket couldn't see much friendliness in that stare. They sat in silence for a while longer. Shadow Jack still stared intently. Finally, Peasel couldn't stand it any more. You know about the treasure, don't you? He said bluntly. Aye. I do, Shadow Jack admitted. You think anything but treasure would keep me in this hellhole? I've not seen a bloody tree in three months. The giant stretched a burly arm over the forge and shifting Peasel's clothes so that they wouldn't scorch, he took another gulp of his ale. I was a fine smith, you know, he said after a long pause, working out by Kelty across the River Forth. I did all right when we were fighting Napoleon and the army needed cannon and cartwheels like. But after the wall, war, many of the harvest that harvested the land left for the cities. For they have machines now that can do their work. Shadow Jack spat on the floor to show what he thought of me- 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 mechanised farming. Sorry. Me? I couldn't work in some hot, sweaty, cramped factory. Peasel looked incredulously around the sweltering little vault. How on earth did you end up down here? I went to Leith Docks to enlist in the King's Navy. I got to quite like the cannon. Thought I might make a good cabin boy. Peasel frowned. He could never tell if Shadow Jack was joking or just slightly insane. The big man carried on with his tale of woe regardless. I was having a last whisky or three in one of the taverns when I overheard two gypsy types talking in a corner. A might the worst for the grog that they were, and a bit louder than they were intending to be. I only caught the end of what they were saying, but it sounded powerful interesting to me. Another ale? Oh, thanks. Shadow Jack poured more steaming liquid into the boy's cup anyway. Uh, one was telling the other some old gypsy legend about how there was supposed to be treasure hidden in a well under Edinburgh. Shadow Jack took another large swig of his ale. In fact, it was still boiling, and that didn't seem to bother him. And he'd heard from a beggar that there happened to be a blocked-up well at the bottom of the underground city. So you decided to abandon a life on the ocean wave and move here? Peasel looked sceptical. Well, to be honest, I can't swim. The blacksmith took a deep breath. Besides, the only ship in port was a barge carrying treacle to Glasgow. So I came down here, built a forge and opened up the well. He pointed to the forbidding hole in the corner of the vault. Late at night, I'd climb down the shaft and search for the treasure. Took me a while to find it. Not as fast as you, eh? Yeah, I was born lucky, Peasel snorted. Then he had a thought. How are you going to get all that treasure out without anybody spotting it? Simple. Melting it down in the forge. You're what? Instead of replying, Shadow Jack padded over to the darkest corner of the vault and picked up a large knife. Peasel clutched his mug tighter, but the blacksmith pulled a horseshoe from his pocket, scraping at it with the blade, and he held it out. Under the dirty iron surface, the metal gleamed brightly. Peasel drew in breath sharply. Throw a bit of dirt on it when it's hot and a silver horseshoe will look as drab and worthless as any iron one. When I've turned all the the treasure into those horseshoes, I'll pile them in a cart and I'll ride out of Edinburgh, rich man. Your outfit's dry. Wearily, Peasel took the stiff warm clothes and began to put them on. Shadow Jack stood up and stretched. The movement put him between the pickpocket and the vault door and his shadow rose menacingly up the wall and flickered across the roof. He was still holding the knife. There is only one flaw in my plan. He looked darkly at the boy. 
Peasel shrank back from the bushy gaze. Anyone told on me, I'd find myself fighting off every thief and beggar in the city. I wouldn't tell, said Peasel in a small voice. Not ever. I want to believe that, lad, said Shadow Jack, taking a step forward. Peasel saw that the giant was sweating more than he ever had, working on his forge. The knife was still in his hand, reflecting the blood-red glow of the fire. I like you, boy, but that's an awful lot of treasure down there. Peasel began to walk away as Shadow Jack advanced. His mind was working furiously. You're right, that is an awful lot of treasure, he said to his horror that the blacksmith was herding him towards the mouth of the well. It can't be easy melting it down on your own. True. Shadow Jack shifted the knife from one hand to the other, still moving towards the boy. I don't like to leave the vault for more than a few minutes in case someone stumbles on my little operation, and that makes the job slow going. How many horseshoes have you made in a month? Three. OK, I take your point. Peasel was on the edge of the, the, the well mouth now. He could hear the gurgle of the water below and feel cold air rising at the back. What if you had help? He said quickly. You could be finished before you knew it. Shadow Jack stopped and raised a thick black eyebrow. Help? Suppose I was to go down the well and bring out the silver for you to smelt down. My friend Duncan could be the lookout. He's from the Highland. Nobody can sleep, sneak up on him unawares. And he's handy with a sword if he did. Peasel struggled to keep the fear out of his voice and to sound as reasonable and businesslike as possible. Shadow Jack, there is enough silver down there to make all three of us rich a dozen times over. The blacksmith tapped the knife against his cheek while Peasel teetered on the edge of the well. All right, lad, he said suddenly. You have a deal. He shot out a meaty paw and grasped Peasel's hand. The force of his hand shake lifted the boy away from the menacing hole and he bounced around on the end of the blacksmith's arm like a rag doll. Shadow Jack, he said through rattling teeth. Why didn't those gypsies come looking for the treasure themselves? The shaking stopped. I don't know, lad, the giant Jack blacksmith said evenly. Leith is a rough area. Maybe something unfortunate happened to them. He let go of the pickpocket's hand and gave a toothy grin. Off you go, find your pal, come right back. Don't ask any more daft questions. And Peasel went, still shaking like a leaf. I don't know if I really trust Shadow Jack, do you? Anyway, clean your teeth. Keep washing your hands because it is so important. Snuggle into your bed. Give yourself a lovely big cuddle because you're worth it. And hopefully I'll see you tomorrow for the next chapter. Night-night.